Come on. Come on. Come on in the room. Or should I sing it? Come on in the room. Listen, I have been waiting for you since Thursday. Like for real. Last Sunday, when I did not get the chance to preach to you all because I was on my daddy duties and just taking care of my baby girl, this word was already brewing in me. So like, I'm prepared to give you a message that I believe can greatly help your spiritual evolution. I'm honored each and every week, every Thursday and every Sunday to be an individual, just a vessel that God has chose to give you spiritual nutrients. So I want to get to work. Thank you everybody who prayed for my household, prayed for my family, prayed for my baby girl. She has fully recovered and daddy now has a chance to spread the goodness of Jesus and the gospel. I'm ready. Are you ready? If you're ready, can I get you to put in the room? I'm ready. Go ahead and greet somebody. Hey girl, I see you. Hey my dude, I see you. And let's get to this message. Two verses. Two verses for our foundational text will come up from 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 11, verses one and two. It says, King Solomon, this is David's son. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women. Certain translations say strange women. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites and the Sidonians and the Hittites. They were from the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them. Listen, God saying that's not a candidate. That's not a prospect. That's not even an option. You must not intermarry with them. Why? Because they will surely turn your heart. Because they will surely turn your heart after their gods. Look at this, y'all. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. I wonder if there's anybody who has ever loved the wrong thing. Solomon was holding fast to them in love. Here's the question. As we start this off, here's the question. What are you in love with that's turning your heart? What are you in love with that is turning your heart? Can I get somebody to put in the room, I'm warning you, I'm warning you. I'm warning you, I'm warning you. What are you in love with that's turning down your peace and turning down your joy and turning down your purity and turning down your confidence and turning down your wholeness? What are you in love with that's turning your heart? I would like to speak around this thought. I'm already giving you the title because I'm ready to work. I would like to speak around this thought from this subject for just a few moments on this beautiful Sunday night. I'm warning you. I am warning you. It's confession time. I just feel this. Can I get you guys to type and put in the room? Make sure you do this in all caps because I firmly believe that this is for somebody. Can I get somebody to put this in the room? Father, open my eyes and give me the humility to see your warnings and act accordingly. All caps. This is for somebody. Father, Open my eyes, open my eyes and give me the humility to see your warnings and act accordingly. And I want to get us to a place. The reason I'm preaching so passionate, just an in introduction. I want to get us to a place to where we trust in the plan of God so much so. We trust in the timing of God so much so that when we don't get something, we really don't even get upset. I really don't even get upset because I have this perspective that God opens doors that he cosmically created for me to walk into and he shuts doors that must be a form of him protecting me. So I'm not even getting upset about what walked away. I'm not even getting upset about what I didn't get approved for because whatever God has for me truly is for me. I want us to trust God so much so to when he says no, I trust him. When he says, wait, I trust him. When he says, I have better, I trust him. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. Solomon, 
Don't intermarry with those women. Somebody in the room, you're like, Jessica, stop looking at those type of men. James, stop looking at those type of females. I don't care that she thick. Stop looking at those type of females. These are the ones that will turn your heart against God. And I believe, I believe we have done the body a disservice. I believe we have done the body a disservice because there are so many messages that are preaching about the rewarding of God, but what is underpreached is the warnings of God. Hear me, hear me. There's so many messages that preach about the rewarding of God. You gonna get blessed. It's your season, it's your time. God's gonna bless you with a house and God's gonna bless you with a raise and God's gonna bless you with a car and God's gonna bless you with more money, more money. God's gonna bless. There's so many sermons that are speaking about the rewarding of God. But we often underpreach the warnings of God. Now listen, listen, this is what I want us to get. There's a connection. If I don't take heed to the warnings of God, I won't be in position to experience the rewarding of God. Did y'all hear me? If I don't take heed to the wisdom and the warnings of God, I won't be in position to receive the rewarding of God. But I want him. But I want that offer. But I want that opportunity. God's like, listen, uh, red flag, red flag. My hand's not on this. Yeah, but I get more money. Yeah, but red flag, red flag. Your children need you. Every open door is in God. Some of them are spiritual ambushes, playing dress up. I need you to seek my face so you can hear when I'm warning you about something that is not my will. And I get it. I get it. Sermons that speak mainly about the rewarding of God, they'll get people to shout. They'll get people to share this message. It'll probably grow your platform. You'll, pro you'll probably get more subscribers, more likes, and that was a word today, sir, or that was a word today, ma'am. You might get all of that, but it is the wisdom and the warnings of God that cause for us to miss unnecessary pain. It is the wisdom and the warning of God that causes for us to miss unnecessary seasons. You and I are gonna go through seasons, but some seasons are unnecessary. Can I get somebody to put unnecessary in the room? Yeah, it's the wisdom and the warning of God that makes us miss unnecessary wounds. Because hear me, there's some wounds that you can't avoid. It's not that God has to use pain. It's not that God has to use pain to teach us. It's just that for many of us, that's the only way we learn. Oh, we. I told you I'm waiting all week. I'm waiting all week. It's not that God has to use pain to teach us. It's just that for many of us, pain is the only way we learn. Like, like it's going to be hard for you to hear the warnings of God when you have already decided what you want God to say. Oh, this is coming for somebody's life tonight. It's going to be hard for you to effectively see the red flags and effectively hear the warnings of God when you have already decided what you want God to say. Yeah, I prayed about it. I prayed about it. I have a peace. I, I got my confirmation. I have a peace. I have a peace about it. Is that God's peace? Or is that your peace? It's going to be hard for us to effectively see the warnings of God when you have already decided what you want God to say. And the reason why your spiritual intelligence matters, the reason why your relational wisdom matters, the reason why your healing matters is because wounds become potters. Listen, wounds become potters. They mold you. They mold your personality. They mold the way that you view men. They mold the way that you view women. They mold the way you view church. They mold the way you view pastors. They mold the way you view relationships. They mold the way you view marriage. They mold your perspective and they mold the way you respond. But healed people respond different. This is so good, y'all. 
Healed people respond different. When I'm wounded, I only can respond really out of three things. When I'm wounded, I respond out of defending me, my insecurity, or my fear that you will leave a wound on me just like they did. Did y'all hear me? When I'm wounded, something hurt me and it has not been healed. I will respond to you out of defending myself. I will respond to you out of my insecurities and I will respond to you out of fear that you will do the exact same thing to me that they did. And so now what ends up happening because I haven't dealt with my wounds, I can't even have effective communication. I can't have healthy communication. You only know one mode when it comes to communicating, defending self. That's it. Because I have not healed, I only know one mode. I'm going to protect me. I'm good. I'm good. I'm cool. You know what? I, I don't need y'all. If y'all leave, leave. I, I'm straight. I'm cool. I, I can do this on my own. I'm good. I'm good. No, we don't need to talk about it. I don't need to talk about it. I'm cool. I can handle this on my own. I was cool before you. I'm going to be cool after you. I'm good. No, you're not. No, you're not. You just fear repeated pain. I'm talking to somebody. You fear repeated pain. Hear me, y'all. Listen, hear me. You cannot force yourself not to talk about it and label that as healing. You can't force yourself not to talk about it and label that as healing. Some of, some of us have adjusted to not talking and label that as I'm healed. <laughs> when you're wounded, there's really only one response that you have when it comes to communicating, and that is defending myself. Because when I have a history of being betrayed, when I have a history of people hurting me, by default, I push away the people who really do love me. And I push away the people that I really do want to love back. I want to love them back, but I have put a wall on my heart I have put a wall over my heart that has arrested and imprisoned my real emotions. Like you saying that you're good and you saying that you're over it, that's not your authentic self. I just don't want repeated pain. Like I have measured my strength by how much I could take. I, I don't want repeated pain. So I tell you I'm good, but my pillowcase catches my tears. I tell you I'm good, but on social media, I'm venting about the situation. I'm not good. And I'm pushing away the people who really do love me and I want to love them back. But I've walled my heart. So me walling my heart, that has imprisoned my emotions and my real self. Listen, y'all, I have to remind you. The text tells us to guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it flows the issues of life. The text does not say wall your heart. The difference between a guard and a wall, a guard's job is to screen and evaluate. I want you to view the Holy Spirit as your spiritual TSA. Is there anything on you that you have in your luggage that is considered hazardous material for where I'm taking you? You can't board the flight of love until this has been thrown away. You can't bore with that. So the Holy Spirit is going to let you know this is not an individual. This is not an opportunity. Maybe this is not even a church that's conducive for the flight that I'm trying to take you on. I need to screen guards, screen, evaluate, and collect data. And upon further review, they decide access granted or access denied. That's a guard. But a wall, nobody can get in. And you can't get out. Your pain can't get out. Your trauma can't get out. Your insecurity can't get out. So your cellmates are your real emotions. But everybody else thinks you're good because of what you're saying with your fake emotions. <laughs> Wounded people talk different, but healed people respond different. Healed people respond different. When I'm healed, from verbal abuse, when I'm healed from verbal abuse, 
I can articulate my perspective respectfully without cursing you out to get my point across. Oh, Lord. Do you feel like you always got to curse people out for them to hear you? When I'm healed from verbal abuse of childhood or verbal abuse from that last relationship or that last marriage, when I'm healed from that, I don't have to be verbally abusive myself to get my point across. But rather, I could communicate and articulate my point respectively without being violent to you because I'm healed. When I'm healed from whoever walked out of my life, and it may not be because I did something, Sometimes, see, I have to say this because we always identify other people as a red flag. They left me. They just did me so wrong. I don't know why. I don't know. Sometimes it's not, <laughs> it's not the red flags in them. You could be a walking red flag yourself. Lord, you could be a walking red flag yourself. And so sometimes when they exit it, it's not because, oh, you know, they just couldn't. It could be because God was protecting them from you. I need to spend a season with you. My God. I need to spend a season with you so that you're not a walking red flag labeling everybody else as a counterfeit. That's a whole nother sermon. But anyway, when you're healed, when people walk away and you didn't do anything, you understand two things. Number one, the wrong ones have to walk out. The wrong ones have to walk out so that the right ones can walk in. I need to say that for somebody else. When you understand and you're healed, you're healed, you understand two things. Number one, the wrong one has to walk out so that the right one can walk in because I've stated it so many times, endings are married to sendings. Some things can't be sent until some things have went. I know that's not grammatically correct, but it rhymed and you got the point. Some things can't be sent until some things have went. That's the first perspective. The second perspective is you understand somebody not being interested in me is not a reflection of my value. Ooh. Somebody's, somebody not taking interest in me is not a reflection of my value. Look, marriage is not proof of God's goodness. God is eternally good. Did you hear me? Marriage is not proof of God's goodness. God himself, Yahweh Adonai all by himself is eternally good. If he doesn't give anything else, he is good. His goodness, that's just who he is. Being good is like his name. Being good is like his heart. Being good is like his attribute. He's good even when life isn't. So therefore, we can understand that the lack of of somebody understanding what you carry is not a receipt of your value. Did y'all hear me? I feel like I'm freeing somebody. The lack of somebody not being able to discern what you carry, that is not the receipt. That is not the receipt of your value. Your discernment issue is not my identity issue. It's not my fault that you can't discern I'm dope. It's not my fault that you can't discern I'm called. It's not my fault that you can't discern that I'm a good thing. It's not my fault that you can't understand that I'm a kingdom man. Your discernment issue is not my identity issue. Stop letting people in the comment section cause you to question God's masterpiece because you are his masterpiece. Stop letting people in the comment section cause for you to question God's masterpiece or God's timing because you are his masterpiece. Now for the next few moments, it's going to get real. <laughs> so I'm like, it's been real. It's going to get real for about the next three minutes. Are y'all ready? I need us to understand marriage does not eliminate. Marriage illuminates. One more again. Marriage does not eliminate. Marriage illuminates. It is the peekaboo of behind closed doors. <laughs> Only difference is you're not laughing. <laughs> it's the peekaboo of behind closed doors. The only difference is you're not laughing. That baby might laugh when you peekaboo. That baby might laugh. Uh, but when you get a peek of your boo behind closed doors, Yes, I did that. When you get a peek 
of your boo, when you get a peek of that person that you just said for better or for worse to, when you get a peek of their behind closed doors, that boo hits different. Like that's scary for real, because this is a commitment that you have just made to somebody. And it's possible that I have engaged in haste living so much so to where God was warning me and I didn't see it. I was moving so fast with him or her or this opportunity that I didn't see the red flag clearly. I only saw it in a blur or I wanted it so bad that when God was trying to warn me, I didn't hear it because I already decided what I wanted God to say. Listen, y'all, this is why I'm trying to get people to understand. Stop questioning yourself because of what they posted. That's why part one of this series was the wedding day. Listen, there are a lot of married people who are living in chaos behind the retina display. Chaos behind the retina display. Some married people have sacrificed their mental health and their sanity on the altar of appearance. You don't know what is behind the retina display. So stop questioning Adonai because of what they just posted and why God hasn't done this in your life. You don't even know, boo-boo. You are comparing your life to somebody who has just settled. Every person who got married, heaven didn't endorse that. Yeah, but if I got to be somebody else's bridesmaid, thank God that you are a bridesmaid. You don't have no clue what they just said forever, forever, forever to. And I need to be in a place where I trust God, even when it doesn't go the way I want it. Stop, stop questioning your value. Stop questioning your value because sometimes it takes for me to heal, for me to even think like that. For me to even think like, when it's my time, God's going to give it to me. When it's, when it's not my time, God's developing me, developing them, or he's preparing something. Your spiritual intelligence matters. Your relational wisdom matters. This is why Proverbs 22, verse 3, it tells us one man sees danger and takes refuge, but the other one sees danger and keeps going, and suffers for it. So the text is saying one person, one person saw the warnings of God and they stopped it. They ended it. They didn't respond to that late night text message. They're not desperately dating because you cannot be spirit led and serial date at the same time. Oh, we, God has not given you multiple hearts for you to break. You want to break their heart? What about his heart? What about her heart? What about their heart? What about all these hearts? God is not giving you multiple hearts to break. One person sees the warnings of God and recognize this has to end. Listen, this, this cutoff, this cutoff, it's not personal, it's spiritual. This is not healthy. This is toxic. I recognize God sends kingdom, not parasites. God Sins kingdom, not parasites. And how do you know when it's parasitic? It's when it's draining you. Draining your joy. Draining your hope. Causing for you to compromise. Because spiritual decay happens one compromise at a time. God sins kingdom, not parasitic. Okay? Here it is. I told y'all I was going to get real. I told y'all I was going to get real. Listen. When you are in the kingdom, it is easier for you to identify royalty. Okay, here it is. So maybe the reason you cannot identify a queen. Maybe the reason you cannot identify a queen is because you have not applied kingdom principles to your life. Therefore, therefore, the lack of kingdom principles applied to my life is the catalyst on how I keep getting deceived by their life. Woo One more time. The lack of kingdom principles being applied to my life is the catalyst on how I keep getting deceived by their life. God sends kingdom, not parasitic. 
When it's kingdom, I got to give you this reminder. When it's kingdom, the king leads, establish order, and regulates the chaos. So whenever a man shows up in your life, if he does not lead, but rather follows, if he does not establish order, but disrupts order, if he does not regulate the chaos, but births chaos, warning, 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 red flag, red flag, God is not going to send you something that takes you further from him. Don't intermarry with this, Solomon. Don't intermarry with this. This is going to turn your heart from me and it's going to turn your hearts to their gods. Whenever God sends something, if it doesn't lead, provide you with order or regulate the chaos, this is not kingdom. And ladies, y'all not off the hook. Y'all not off the hook. You thought. Y'all not off the hook. Listen, there are some sisters who dwell in chaos so much so. It's not that he doesn't understand you. It's that you only speak chaos. See? 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 I guarantee my whole amen section. Where y'all at? Where y'all at? <laughs> it's not that he just doesn't understand me. Could it be you only speak chaos and he's a king trying to regulate the chaos and establish order? Because when all you do is breathe chaos... Order will feel like you're suffocating. When you're used to breathing chaos, order will feel like you're being suffocated. Kings bring order. But somebody watching this, you have heard it before that God is not the author of confusion. That's your confirmation. You constantly confused with who you with. What are we? So are we together? Or are we not? Is he going to be nice? Is he not? Is she going to call me back or not? The fact that you stay in a state of confusion is irrefutable evidence that God has not authored this because God is not the author of confusion. God aligns. If it's for your life, God aligns kingdom men to discover help meets, not to rescue damsels in distress. I'm talking kingdom. Kingdom men. If it is God's will for your life for you to get married, God positions you. He allows your path to cross with somebody who will be a help meet, a help meet for your assignment, not a damsel in distress. Men don't rescue damsels in distress. That's Jesus' job. I know it's getting rough. That's Jesus' job. Men do not rescue damsels in distress. Here it is. There is nothing more frustrating to a kingdom man than to discover a woman who has dreamed about being a wife but has not prepared to be a helper. Same thing, same thing. There is nothing more frustrating for a woman to encounter a male. I didn't say man, I said male. Because when you're born, you're a male. Being a male is a state of birth. Being a man is a matter of choice. Paul said, when I became a man, I put away Childish things. One of the litmus tests, the sign of biblical manhood is the putting away of things, the putting away of selfishness, the putting away of entitlement, the putting away of fits and rage, fits of rage. There's nothing more frustrating to a woman than for you to encounter, for you to encounter a male who wants to be in a leadership position, but they not going nowhere. See, this is both. Sometimes for the brothers, <laughs> then sometimes for the ladies. <laughs> There's nothing more frustrating for him to say that he's the head and he's a leader, but we're not heading and you're not leading me nowhere. Or what's worse, when you want to lead, but you're not being led yourself. All right. All right. <laughs> Listen, I think sometimes we have to understand that there are a lot of ministries, a lot of ministries that are monetizing your idolatry. They're monetizing your idolatry and your trauma and telling you to shout about the title, but they don't equip you for the function. Like wife is title. Help meet is function. Husband, that's title. Leader, that's the function. And so I need to be able to be skilled and learn how to carry out the function, not just the title. Do you really want godly relationships? Do you really want godly relationships? Hear me. Let's park here for a second. Do you really want an individual 
that make sure that you keep God first. Because if you cool with God not even being second, third, or fourth, when you meet somebody who keeps on pushing you to put God first and that's not your heart, they're going to get on your nerves. Do you really want a godly relationship? When you feel like giving somebody a piece of your mind, but then he tells you, you know what? Be the bigger person. We don't have to clap back. We don't have to respond to them on the level that they came at us on. When they go low, we go high. Rise above that. Remember, a wise one can overlook an offense. Overlook means to look above. I'm above that. You may feel like he's not hearing you. You may feel like he's not taking your side. He's not supportive. He don't have my back. I need a man who's going to ride for me. Do you really want a godly relationship? Or have you believed the myths about marriage? When I look at this text about Solomon, I don't see it's the Moabites pursuing him. I don't see the Edomites pursuing him. I don't see the Ammonites or the Hittites pursuing him. I see Solomon pursuing them. Do you really want a godly relationship? Can you identify the warnings of God. So I'm going to give you some myths of marriage that could be warnings for anybody who believes that this is a truthful statement about marriage. Look at this. Number one, marriage does not cure lust or is it a safe house for the horny? If you believe my flesh out of control, I'm just on fire. My flesh. If you believe that, so I'm going to escape it by getting married. That's a myth. You still need self-control. Just because you said I do, horniness doesn't mean it went away and said I do too. <laughs> you may say I do, but your flesh may be like, we don't. We don't. We've been watching porn all week. We've been watching porn and masturbating all the way up to this altar. We, I, you could say I do to her, but I don't. I don't. Every female that passed by that stick and that looks good to me, I'm going to lust. Every man that has some broad shoulders and girl, he got a beard, I, I'm going to... Just because you say, I do, does not mean your flesh says, I do too. This is why the single state, gosh, this is why the single state is so imperative. It gives me space to unlearn. It gives me space to detox. It gives me space to become prepared for the function because marriage does not cure lust, nor is it a safe house for the horny. Number two, marriage will complete you. That's a lie. Marriage will not complete you. It will expose you. It will expose. Marriage exposes your loneliness. It doesn't, it doesn't fix it. You're so clingy because I was lonely before them. People cannot fulfill your loneliness. Purpose does that. Purpose does that. The cure for loneliness is not company, it's calling. That's a myth. Number three, we love each other. That's all that matters. That's a lie. That's a lie. We see in our foundational texts, but Solomon loved many foreign women. The women that God said, don't marry them. You can love the wrong one. You can love the wrong thing. Just because you say we love each other, it's going to work. That's not true. What makes things work is purpose. What makes it work is calling and destiny. We have to have something in common besides Kiki Key. We have to have, that's laughing. We have to have something in common besides recreational activities. We have to have something in common besides history. We have to have something in common besides the bedroom. It's called purpose. It's your calling. It's your destiny. It's the reason God cosmically created you. Does your assignment and does my assignment complement? Therefore, it's dangerous when you enter into a relationship with somebody who doesn't know why they're here because they'll make you their purpose. This is so good, y'all. Number four, fourth myth about marriage. Difficulty means divorce. That's not true. That's not true. I'm not talking about a, a, a unhealthy, narcissistic, abusive. Difficulty does not mean divorce. In fact, your marriage will be hard. 
You can have exactly who God wants for you to have, and it's still hard. You know why? Because dying to yourself is a beast. Y'all talk to me. Don't leave me out here by myself. Amen, sir. Amen, pastor in the room. Talk like your flesh by itself is a beast. Period. Marriage is a covenant to die to you and give God the glory. If you're selfish, marriage isn't for you. It's not. It's a call to die to self. Just because it's hard, I'm going to mess y'all up. Do you know actually that multiple breakups classically condition your heart to quit? Yeah, I had 20 boyfriends. Whoa, girl. Yeah, I had about 15. Whoa, my dude. Like you have classically conditioned your heart. When I don't like them, when it gets hard, when it gets tough, when I'm confronted, I'm out. Just because it's difficult does not mean divorce. Number five, marriage cures loneliness. I already touched that. But if there's one thing I want to add to that, that we can understand, marriage is not a confirmation that you have value. It's not. God is not giving you marriage so that you can prove to somebody, see, I'm worth something. Marriage is for the glory of God, for us to live for Christ, serve one another, and for me to show to the world what it looks like to love and serve sacrificially. Number six, we just click. We don't get married because we just, I mean, the first conversation, I just fell over in love. Like, we just click. You could click with a demon. Devils know what you like too. You can click with a counterfeit. The enemy knows what makes you smile. The enemy knows what you're attracted to. He comes as an angel of the light. He's a master of disguise. Backwards. He's going to disguise himself as the master. We don't go off of we just click. We go off of purpose. Number seven, the one everybody's not going to like. Marriage is for everybody. That's not true. That's not true. Some people don't even want to get married. And it's not due to trauma or bad. They just don't. I don't want to have to share my food. I don't want to have to share my house. If I want the air on 61, I could do that. If I want the air on 76, I could do And I don't want to share. I don't want to have to. If that's you, that's you. You may have a calling to be a missionary working in Sudan and then another minute you're over in Korea, then another minute you're in California helping with some tour. I don't know what your call is, but just because you don't desire marriage, don't allow culture to make you think that you're gay. Just because I said that most pastors won't just because you don't desire to be with somebody. Don't allow culture to make you think this must mean I like the same sex. This must mean I like women and I'm a woman. You may have been ordained by God to do a specific missionary work that marriage is not for you when you don't know the truth. You will allow culture to twist a truth to deceive you in following their bondage. Marriage is not for everybody. God gives us warning systems. And for Solomon, his warning was, don't marry with them. Don't like, like, like he didn't even recognize he was dealing with his daddy's struggle. David had a little lust issue. Some of us don't even recognize spirits that we're dealing with. It's not just yours. It's an ancestor spirit. It's not just you. It's been in your bloodline. He's warning you. Look, look, I want to give you Bible. Look, um, chapter 11, verse 4, it says, For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his hearts. God told him, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. That was verse 1 and 2. Verse 4. For when Solomon was old, his wife turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord, his God, as was the heart of David, his father. Like, I warned you. You saw the red flag when he sent you the DM. I'm warning you. You saw the red flag when you went to the Thanksgiving dinner and you saw how he talked to his mama. I'm showing you. God gives us the gift of free will. 
but he also will allow you to see signs and indicators when his hand is on a thing and when his hand is not. So in with this, and with this, how do we understand the warning systems of God? Number one, there will be an unsettling. How does God warn us? I don't want to just tell you, hey, watch the warnings. I need you to identify when God is warning. How? He gives you an unsettling. I said this all throughout the Try Me series. It's not gas that has your stomach churning like that. It's the Holy Spirit. You felt it driving to the apartment. You felt it making the merit, you felt it making the wedding arrangements. That unsettling. Some of us are looking for an audible voice from God to tell us this is me or this is not. And he's answering you with the unsettling. You can't sleep. You don't have peace. This, this unsettling on the inside, that's one of God's ways of warning you. It's not me. It's not me. You're trying to make it. And here's the thing. When God warns you in the mode of an unsettling, it never stops. It never stops. You can go on the date. You'll still have it. You can go to their apartment. You'll still have it. You can fly out with them. You'll still have it. On the vacation, post some picture, pictures with them. You'll still have it. It'll never stop. It'll never stop. It's God's way of warning that this is not me. The second way God warns us is repetition. You keep hearing the same thing over and over and over and over and over. It's like God gives looped confirmation. He gives looped confirmation. It's over and over and over and over. Like I told you that one time before I was with Tanisha, I was with another young lady. And I kept feeling over and over, I don't know if this is God's will for my life. Y'all remember I told you I had a dream that I was late to a test and some girl took me to take the test and the professor was like the highest you can get is 85 and I woke up from the dream and I was mad and I didn't know what the dream meant and I prayed about it and then later on God revealed to me, the girl you're dating, the highest you can get with her is 85. Every time she did something, if she didn't answer the phone, 85. If I bought her McDonald's and I got two hot and spices with cheese, I was in college, y'all. I got two hot and spices with cheese, apple pie, and a McFlurry and she gonna ask, where's the ketchup? 85. It was just stand with me, looped over and over and over. God will give you constant repetition, warning to let you know that this is not me. Number three, God warns in dreams. Make sure you pray on these. Make sure you pray on these so that you can really get confirmation if this is God warning me to do something. Christmas story all day. Joseph, wake up and take Mary to this place because the people who are seeking to take his life are coming to kill him. Warning, God gives warnings in dreams. Number four, God gives warnings in vessels, like myself, like another pastor, like a brother. It could be to somebody who doesn't even know God. I remember I was at the club. I was at the club and somebody walked up to me like, bro, you don't even look like you belong here, dog. <laughs> Like, I, was, I don't. I know I don't. I'm not having fun. It's hot. Smell like weed. I want to go. Hey, let's go. He's like, no, nah, I'm turning up. I, I just couldn't stand it. But God gives warnings and vessels. Number five, God will give you a warning by a close call. A bullet. Something almost happened. It's a close call. It's like, yo, this, this lifestyle that you're living, it's on dangerous terrain. That close call, whatever it was, is a way of God saying, make the next exit and you turn down the lane of repentance. Turn away. And the last one, God gives warnings through third party observation. All you gotta do is just look. Look how her life came out because she settled. Look at how his life came because he didn't listen to wisdom. Your spiritual intelligence, relational wisdom, and your healing matters. And it's gonna be hard for you to hear the warnings of God when you've already decided what you want him to say. So God, would you help us? There's so much to feast on this, God, but would you help us look at this biblical narrative from Solomon's life and learn when you warn us to not go a route, to not respond away, or to not engage 
in a relationship. Help us take heed to those warnings. Experience is a hard teacher, but wisdom is the best teacher. Awaken our souls where every time you are telling us, this is not me, this is not me, this is not me, give us the boldness, the faith, and the spiritual wisdom to listen to you because I trust you even if it cost me what I really want. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.